This is Derek O'Fodder and well with The Medicine Shell, and today I'm going to discuss Uga, the four world ages in Igbo cosmology, how our ancestors conceptualized the passing of human history into four ages, and the four forms human beings took in each of these ages, and continue to take today. And finally, how the exact same concept appears identically in another culture, in a part of the world that you would never expect. And why two people separated by continents and oceans came to the same conclusion about the history of the human race and our access to our spiritual ability. If you're new to this channel, I discuss Igbo cosmology, spirituality, and history. If this is a topic that interests you, hit subscribe and ring the bell icon so that you get notifications every time I post a video. It also helps the channel when you subscribe because it allows YouTube to recommend it to people who have similar interests to you, which means a lot to the channel. If there are any topics that you're interested in that I may mention in the video, leave a comment below requesting a full video on it and I'll go ahead and do that. I choose which topics to cover based on the comments, so all of your questions and recommendations help a lot. You can also support this channel by sharing it with anybody who you feel would be interested, but the best way to support the channel is by joining us on patreon.com slash the medicine show. Patrons have access to an in-house debia for divination and guidance from a spiritual perspective in accordance to our ancestors. Patrons also have access to our Odinani live study, which is a live chat where we go in-depth on certain topics and how they apply to everyday life today. I now have all of the previous sessions that we have on a playlist, so you can always go back and watch the ones that you missed. Patrons also have access to my full e-library, which are all of the e-documents and books I use for my research. And all this is available at patreon.com slash the medicine shell. Igo Afondibo, or the Igbo Ancestral Calendar, is now available to all patrons. It is a digital calendar that I put together that syncs with your Google Calendar and lets you track which market day it is, the 13 moons, and different holidays, rites, and observances throughout the year. It also gives explanations to each moon and each of these rites so that you can follow along in your own comfort. All of this is available at patreon.com slash the medicine shell. And with that being said, let's begin. Our ancestral worldview has the existence of the human race divided into four ages. Within each age, the relationship between the individual and the universe takes a radically different pivot from the previous, giving each age its own specific spiritual makeup, which then determines the behaviors and outcomes of that era. And therefore, in knowing these four ages, one can gain a fuller understanding of human culture and our connectivity to Chuku and the universe today. These four ages are known as Uga, and Uga is an era and one of many demarcations of time in the ancestral world view. Like all things, each Uga has its own chi, and therefore serves as a shared destiny and identity for all those within a single Uga, meaning that each Uga produces a unique type of human being with attributes shared among those who were born within the same Uga, attributes that you should understand by the end of the video. The Uga serve time the way seasons serve the year. Like seasons, the four Uga are on a fixed cycle, which repeat themselves again and again for the full duration of the universe's existence. Like seasons, each Uga has its own temperature and characteristics that make it unique among the others. Each Uga creates or introduces a new type of human being with a specific nature based on the Uga that it emerged. Each of the four ages produces a tone and a tempo for the spiritual half of the universe, as the rules of human interface between the astral and unseen with the worldly and seen changes each Uga. And by the end of this video, you should not only see that we are completing the first world cycle, but also what that means and how it has impacted the nature of Mada and our relationship or connection to Chuku and the universe. While human history is divided into four Uga, each Uga is then divided into Uke, which are ages within an Uga, and each Uke itself is divided into Obo, or age grades. And while in this video I'm going to focus on the Uga, it is interesting to note that the Obo, or the age grades, are collections of individuals born within a three to four year period. I cover the concept of Obo, or the age grade system, and how it was used by our ancestors in their educational system in my video, Traditional Education Explained. So if you're interested, the link is below. The four world ages are as follows. There is Ugaka, Ugachi, Ugamu, and finally, Ugazi. The first world age is Ugaka, which is defined by oneness. 
a oneness with each other, and a oneness with Chuku and Eke, all of creation. In this time, the human mind and being saw no distinction between it and creation. All things existed as one single consciousness, a single awareness. As extensions of creation rather than a creation unto itself, the people of Ugaka experienced no death, nor did they sleep, hunger, or eat food. Rather, all was sustained through the mind and through Mendu or breathing alone. It is said that in this time, humanity was light without tangible physical forms, not yet acquiring material bodies, and that in this age, their primary home was Obichuku. The earth itself existed as an excursion or vacation place, and it is said that of all the light beings that existed in Obichuku, only a few came to the earth and remained here to gain human form and become the human race meaning that there are celestial cousins who never manifest in human form who live beyond our realm till this day. Based on the stories from this time, the use of physical force or effort to attain things was unknown, as oneness with Chineke and a lack of physical form made this unnecessary. In this time, oneness with creation and creator allowed human beings to enter and exit Obichuku at will. Obichuku is the celestial abode of Chuku, the creator, and the source of creation itself, the nucleus and point of causation by which creation radiates out from. It is said that the people of Ugaka lived in Akun, the nest of Chuku, the way an unhatched egg lived in the nest of its mother. This is also important to note, as the time of Ugaka was a time of darkness, when the world was said to be in a shadow or shadowy in essence. It is also important to note that an individual egg does not eat externally, nor does it need sleep. At the same time, it is one with its mother, needing its mother's presence and body heat for its own regulation. The ability to enter and exit Obichuku at will was not only caused by the oneness of the Ugaka people, or Umwaka, a term that is used today to say children. The ability to reach Obichuku at will also came from the purity of character, spirit, body, and mind of each and every living person in this era. In this age, the first people, also known as Ndimbu, did not lie, fight, or act against universal order. Until this day, individuals who bear titles that make them living ancestors abide by the principles of Ndimbu, the first people. Among these people are those who hold the awful, an ancestral sacred staff that compels its holder to abide by the rules of Nimbu, the first people, and their principles, which I'll explain as I discuss Ugachi. Another set of people who have taken an oath to represent Nimbu, or the first ancestors, are those who take the title of Nze and Ozo. Both Nze and Ozo are men who have taken a vow to become living ancestors, and are thus ritually bound not to lie, go against the principles of the Alpha that they swore their title to. With both titles, you'll see use of the feather to represent an individual who has the title. In Igbo symbology, a feather is key to accessing the heavens, as it is key to the flight of the bird. The feather therefore represents purity and lightness of heart, and thus the feather is awarded to individuals who can access Obichuku, as ritually both Nze and Ozo must undergo a ritual death and reawakening in their new form. It is also interesting to note that the Ozo, which is the most expensive title in Igbo land, requires a period of fasting for a single moon roughly 28 days, the same amount of time it takes an egg to hatch. And the fasting period of the Ozo is done in isolation in a room known as Akwazo, the nest of the Ozo. If you're interested in the video of the Ozo title, comment below. I'll also leave a link to the Inze Explained video for those who haven't seen it. The lack of corruption experienced in Ogaka was characterized by the ability to speak the first language, which itself was the language of the universe, Afa. The Afa language is today used for divination and ritual, and is the root of the knowledge system we know today as Igbo cosmology. One who is new to the Afa language will notice terms used, while being recognizable to the modern Igbo speaker, differ greatly from concept to concept from modern Igbo. According to our ancestors, the language preserved in Afa is the original language, not only speaking by Dibya Afa, or diviners, but by nature itself, and by Mo, or the spirit. It is from this language that the Igbo language derives, as it is the first language ever spoken, and a language that connected all things at one point. For this reason, the Igbo language, which is the accessible version of the first language, 
is used exclusively for ritual items that signify the time of our ancestors, such as the RG, the Kolonut, and the all four. It is also interesting to note that based on my own research, um, I've been able to see that Afa is the divinatory language used from Cameroon to Guinea-Bissau and possibly further, but that's as far as my own knowledge goes, or more specifically within the cultures of the uh, Niger-Congo language family. And in the space between Igbo land to modern Togo, the name Afa is still used to this day, though with different pronunciations. So in Benin, which is west of Igbo land, the term is Afa or Minibo or the Afa of the Igbo people. North of Igbo land and Igala land, it's known as Efa. In Yoruba culture, it's known as Ifa. The Urubo call it Efa. And it again becomes Afa in the Ewe culture of Benin and Togo. If you're interested in a video on Afa, comment below. The ability for Ndimbu during Ugaka to sense their own oneness with the universe and speak its language allowed them to communicate beyond the human realm. In the time of Ugaka, human beings without ritual or tools of aid possessed the ability to communicate with trees, animals, natural features such as rivers, mountains, and lakes, as well as each other. And in this time, Many of the formative stories in our ancestors' traditional lore take place. It is important to note that every story in Igbo lore takes place in one of the four world ages, and there are key details in each story that will tell you when the story takes place. For Ugaka, stories in this time are usually formative in human creation, meaning they often exist to explain Wamado, or the world of people and the way things are. They also go into the creation of various aspects of human existence, especially the most fundamental of them. And because the level of communication of Ndimbu and how freely they were able to communicate with the universe, these stories also feature talking aspects of nature, such as natural features or animals, or people who share names with animals such as a man named Snake or a woman named Dog, as during Ugaaka, human beings bore the same names as trees and animals. In my video, Sacred Animals Part 1 and 2, I point out how our ancestors held a belief that the more or auraic spiritual essence of an individual can be shared with an animal, and oftentimes that individual can appear in your dreams as that animal, because what you sense in the aura of the individual their more is similar to what you'll sense from that animal. The blurry distinction in the realm of dreams is a remnant of how our ancestors saw themselves in Ogaka. Many stories from this era feature direct learning from Chuku and direct receiving, and at times the Aba or spirit forces of the elements of the universe. One of the most famous of these stories is how man and women were created. In the Igbo tradition, Ana, the earth, erected two termite hills, as it is said that Ana gives with both hands. But these were not ordinary termite hills, rather cosmic wombs that nested a great gift. When the time was right, Amadioha, the Abara of lightning and thunder, struck both hills with a bolt, which itself was the spark of life. It was then that they burst open and two beings emerged, a human woman, a human man, and from there, the first people were born into creation from Anna, the first mother. Today, a conical mound or a pyramid is still the symbol of Omomo, the manifesting and procreative energy given to all things, but most alive in women. And often you will see this shape in altars and rituals or shrines, and even within the household as the pyramid channels and represents the womb of universal manifestation. I have a video called Omomo Explained, where I go into this concept for those who are interested, and I've left the link below. After Ugaaka came Ugachi. Ugachi struck humanity with a great shock, even tragedy or panic, as Ugachi marked the beginning of self-awareness in human culture. At the beginning of Ugachi came self-awareness. Ndimbu suddenly gained an unanticipated awareness of themselves as something separate from nature. They became aware of the fact that the trees were not the same as them that the animals were not the same as them. And finally, that even among human beings, each individual was separate from the next. In this era, each person was given their own chi, with its own specific destiny and purpose on earth. They became aware of their nakedness and scrambled to cover themselves in the first wares, which were raffia. It is important to note that many of the masquerades, though not all, which wear raffia depict individuals from this time, or use the raffia to allude to the age and antiquity of the masquerade or spirit being depicted, as the first cloth human beings ever wore was foliage. As this realization dawned on them, the first tragedy happened. 
The individuals began to fall asleep and not wake up. This was the coming of death, a phenomena previously unknown to Ndimbu. The first man to die, according to our ancestors, was known as Alili. And the trauma from the great tragedy till this day survives in the Igbo language as a deep, uncontrollable, or mournful cry is known as a kwalili. When death first came, our ancestors were perplexed by the new phenomena, a sleep that never ended, and loved ones who would be gone forever. Bodies turned to dust, and essences returned to an unreachable beyond. There was a great distress in the land, a panic, and for the first time, our ancestors felt something we are all familiar with today, the fear of dying. In their panic, they sought out a plan. With their connection to Chuku fading in Ugachi, the first people made a decision that would change the fate of humanity forever. The first people gathered two creatures who they would give messages. These messages would then be given directly to Chuku by the creature. If everything worked out right, Chuku would hear the plea of the people and reverse his decision to bring death to the world. The people summoned the dog and the chameleon. And because Chuku always hears what is first said, the people told the fast-running dog to tell Chuku that when death takes an individual, they should awake. And because Chuku does not heed the second thought, the people told the slow-moving chameleon that when death takes a person, they should remain asleep. For if Chuku hears the first message spoken, and if the fast-moving dog and the slow-moving chameleon are set free to run to Chuku at the same time, the first message to reach Chuku will be that of the fast-moving dog. So, with the messages delivered, the dog and the chameleon were released, and as planned, the dog blazed ahead of the chameleon, leaving the chameleon in the dust of the fast-moving dog. The dog ran and ran and ran until neither people nor the chameleon could see it anymore. And the people rested assured that the fast-moving dog would get his message to Chuku first and bring the dead among them back to life. But little did they know that the dog had grown hungry from all of the fast running and caught the scent of a woman cooking oil palm soup in her pot. The dog quickly diverted, entering the woman's home, began to lap up the oil soup that it was served. When the dog finished his meal, he got back on the trail. And as always, he ran and ran and ran to Chuku. And upon arriving, the dog delivered the message to Chuku that people should awake once they die. But Chuku looked at the dog and said that I had already spoken to the chameleon who reached me while you were eating palm oil soup. And the chameleon told me that when people die, they should not awaken. And because the chameleon was first, those who die will never awake from death. The fast-moving dog was crushed. Knowing it had failed and doomed life on earth with its fatal mistake, the dog was devastated. But Chuku looked at the dog mercifully and said, You will not leave me with nothing to show for your great journey. So take this and give it back to those who sent you to me. And it was then that Chuku gave the dog a torch of fire so that humanity can see in the dark. And then Chuku spoke again. I will not take death away from the world, but I will allow the dead to return seven times to experience and enjoy the wonder of the world and their families and the people they love again and again. So the dog took the torch and the new laws about death and brought them back to the living. If you're interested in knowing more about the seven cycles of reincarnation, I have a video called Reincarnation Explained, and I will leave the link below. The coming of death also marks the coming of a new type of human. For those born after the arrival of death are our ancestors known as Ndegede. For this reason, ancestors as a whole are referred to as Ndimbu na Ndegede in prayer, speech, and ritual. Ndegede are divine by their ability to function on an astral level, traveling, transforming, and communicating without terrestrial words. This astral communication an ability to tap into the astral realm is known as a Ekili. Ekili is the ancestral method of accessing the astral realm for learning, communicating, seeing, and doing. And it was Ndegede, in the time of Ugachi, 
who first mastered this technique to substitute for their lost connection to Chuku. Because the connection between Bimbu Nandiegede and Chuku was beginning to break, as human beings lost their presence in Aku, the celestial nest. No longer moments away from Obi Chuku, and no longer having the access they once had to the heart of the universe, human beings began to scramble to rebuild the connection that they once had. And this scramble would come to define the milestones of Ugachi. One of the most profound was the building of the first Arushi. And Arushi is a location, device, or shrine dedicated to channeling a particular spirit. Because Ndimbo lacked the knowledge to survive on their own and maintain the universal peace that they once had in the previous era, they began to build Arushi as cosmic satellites in order to channel messages from the universe itself in order to learn how to survive as a species and live in alignment with the universe as well as each other. This was the time of Nechuku, of Uguele. Many of the stories that take place in Ogachi feature Ndimbu Nandegere trying to figure out how to survive and most importantly reestablish their connection with the universe. For example, there's the story of the Chokoloko. When Nandegere found that one day their memory of God's name had left them, a panic ensued. Worried that the source of their answers to the questions of the universe was gone forever, Nimbu Nandiegede began a search for a creature who still remembered the divine name. It was then that they reached the Chokoloko, a tall, clean, gracile bird who stood by the river. And upon listening to the sound that the Chokoloko made, they heard the name of Chuku. They listened closely and they heard it again. Chuku, Chuku. Nimbu realized that even after the memory of the name had left them, that this bird had kept the memory. And it was then that they decided, or they had become certain, that this bird could still reach Obi Chuku unlike them. It was then that the first people devised a plan. They surrounded the Chukuloko, as it said the celestial name, Chuku, Chuku. And in a single pounce, they captured the wise and seemingly all-knowing bird. Ndiegede then told the bird that since you remember God's name, we will sacrifice you so that you can send messages to Chuku for us. The Chukuloko looked at the people and being wise, thought of a trick that would change human culture forever. The Chukuloko told Ndimbu, don't kill me. Kill that my brother who goes to your home regularly. I stay by the river and do not enter your home. Kill the chicken. That is my sibling. So from that day forward, Ndiegede, listening to the plea of the Chokoloko, began to sacrifice the chicken, a sibling of the Chokoloko, in order to send messages to Obi Chuku. And from sacrifice, Ndiegede were able to send messages to the realm they once came from. This marks the beginning of Ituaja, the practice of sacrifice for first avoiding human death by replacing it with animal death as well as using blood as a conduit for universal communication. For Ndiegede, Ituaja unlocked a world of power and intervention. Ituaja gave them the ability to intervene on a higher level in human affairs, to assure their fortune, and reward the forces by which good fortune comes. It was also Ndiegede who learned that it was not the blood itself that was the source of power for Aja, but rather the plasma or plasma barrier surrounding the blood, as this was liquefied life. The plasma barrier for blood serves as a manifestation of more, while the blood itself, which is surrounded by the aura of plasma, is a manifestation of madu. And it is the plasma that Allah more, or the world of more, interacts with. For this reason, much of what can be used as a substitute for blood, such as egg yolk, also possesses the same aura-like membrane. Itua Aja allowed sacrifice to be another source of answers for Ndegede, as their grip on the internal workings of the universe faded. If you're interested in a full video on Aja or sacrifice, comment below. Uh, there's a lot of very interesting things to explore within the concept itself. Through experiments like this, the people of Ugachi established a new way of life and realized that while they were separate from Chuku the Creator, the Creator and creation were one. And what they once received from the creator, they could also receive from creation, though in a new form and with new methods. In the story of Eri, which I have linked below, human beings were able to eat from the sky in the time of Eri. But upon Eri's passing, Chuku instructed his son, Nri, to begin eating from the earth. 
by sacrificing his first daughter, who in many versions of the story is known as Ada, and his first son, who in many versions of the story is known as Njoku. And from their graves, the first crop, which are Ede or Coco Yam and Ji, the Yam, emerged, marking the beginnings of agriculture. While Ji is often translated as Yam, it literally means to hold, as eating earthly food brings an individual closer to the earth. For this reason, many of our ancestral arts feature fasting as a method for reaching realms of existence classed as sky realms, such as astral projection, or reaching the higher realms of self and universe known as Oganigwe. During Ogachi, the foundations of our spiritual and cosmological arts were born. For example, upon the death of the wisest woman who ever lived, Chuku instructed the people to plant an ugili seed in her head, and from this seed came afa, or divination. Individuals were able to connect to nature through the realization that agun, which is within them, is within all things. And on both ends, agun serves as a means of universal communication and a web of connectivity between human beings and the universe. And most importantly, in this era, the Aba gave humanity the laws of universal order and the laws of communal order known as Iwala, which came directly from the earth, or Anna herself. Ugachi began with many stories of great confusion, panic, and disconnection, but through the will to reconnect came an era of human mastery and self-awareness, which gave birth to the esoteric arts that we use today. This mastery of self on a material and astral level paved the way for what we will witness in the Third Age, Ugaun. The Third Age is known as Ugaun, the Age of the Rising Sun. Ugaun marks the rise of human genius, the ability for individuals to master the world around them, and apply universal knowledge to the advancement of the human race. In Ogangu, individuals became adepts and specialists in various fields of human endeavor and mixed practical and astral knowledge to take their respective fields to levels never seen before. In Ogangu, most lost their ability to communicate and access the astral plane through Ekili, but the few who retained it came to change the world around them. In this age, the world was sunny, unlike Ugachi, which is described as when Madu no Nochichi, or when the world was shadowy. On a physical level, this would symbolize what was happening universally, which was the triumph and rise of the sun, and that which comes from it, which I'll elaborate on shortly. The people of this age are known as the children of the rising sun, or Umwaun, receivers and transmitters of Abala. Abala is the divine essence that radiates from one source to another. In this case, Abala is the radiance that emits from Chuku onto existence, from Chi to Eke. And because all things repeat themselves in nature, according to our ancestors, Chuku is represented in microcosm as the sun, or Anyaun, and Abala is represented in microcosm by the rays of the sun. In a human being, this same aura or radiance is known as Mo, the immaterial essence that is you, but radiates from you onto the things and people around you. The radiance of the sun, or Abala, is not only light that reaches and brightens the world, it is also a spirit of enlightenment, projecting Chuku's will and wisdom onto an individual and in creation. It is a source of clairvoyance and wisdom beyond an individual's personal wisdom. This wisdom is known as Uche, and while Uche is often translated as wisdom, it is important to note that in the mind of our ancestors, or Nibo cosmology, the type of wisdom classified as Uche is not owned by an individual. Rather, it is something that is received either as wisdom from another person or insight from forces beyond individuals. Abala is also known as Abya, Abyama, the Abya which reaches the earth, the essence and potency of God radiating onto earth in the form of wisdom and light. The ethereal nature of Chuku, or the radiance of Chuku, is also known as Osebluwa, a divine spirit, which is Chuku the way your mo is you. In Ugaangu, the age of the sun, those who could receive Abala climbed to the heights of their societies and began to use divine wisdom to guide in the rebuilding of the world. In this age, human beings learned Nka, 
or craft, such as ironsmithing. It is also important to note that the world's oldest ironsmithing site is located in Lejayanugu in the Nsuka area of northeast Igbo land and according to our ancestors, was established in this era. Ogangu was also the time by which Chuku began speaking through specific individuals. And across the world, this was an age of prophecy and divine inspiration. Chuku, through the children of the rising sun, shed a level of wisdom onto humanity that allowed for the beginnings of human civilization. Human beings began living in cities. Clothing shifted from raffia, as was the norm in Ugachi, to cloth, which was the new norm and the introduction of the art of weaving at its highest levels. A flourishing in creativity, technology, and art began, and an age of great migration where the sacred arts were spread from the point that they were received onto the rest of the world. In this age, the children of the rising sun traveled across the world, spreading the wisdom that they had received from beyond for the benefit of others. This is the age of the flourishing of gifts from Anyangu, the force sent by Chuku to earth to oversee creation, and our physical exemplar of the chi of an individual, and Chuku as a whole. Anyangu is Chuku's representative on earth. But Anyangu is more than an abara. Like most mother abara, Anyangu is a world onto herself. Within Anyangu is Amadioha, which lives in her forehead. Amadioha is to Chuku what your Ikenga is to you, as both are represented by the ram and possess your fighting ability and will as a human being, as well as an individual's inclination to leadership. The Ikenga is also connected to the right hand, as Amadioha is seen in some cultures as the right hand of Chuku, or the hand that holds the universal awful. And as the holder of this awful, Amadioha is the keeper, protector, and enforcer of universal justice, order, balance, and peace. Umuangu mark themselves with the symbol of the sun, the Ichi. Ichi marks are solar etchings carved on the forehead of an enlightened individual. Upon receiving Ichi, individuals have made a declaration to represent light in the world and all it stands for. The Ichi do not violate the principles of their communities awful or that of their ancestors. They do not violate the principles of the land, and most importantly, they represent Abala, or the godly presence in their community. They are a moral, ethical, and cultural constant in an ever-changing world, and for this reason are a source of guidance and representatives for the ancestors of their people. The children of the rising sun guided the emergence of civilization and godly living wherever they emerged. But on a lesser scale, Ugaamu saw the introduction of environmental destruction. Human beings began cutting down trees and killing animals recklessly, as this was the time that human beings began putting their self-interest first and foremost. This is also the time that human beings began to go to war with one another. And in Ugaamu, Societies began living by a principle of male dominance. But upon seeing the age that will come, many of the enlighteners of the world chose to die with their knowledge and made the conscious decision not to teach the next generation what they know. Because from their visions of the future, the coming world was going to be one where their advancements would be used for bloodshed and destruction. Much of what was known during Wukang died with those who know it, as the hands to come were not seen as worthy or capable of handling power of the knowledge of the children of the rising sun. The people of Wukang saw a future where people would turn completely against nature and one another an age of deceit and death on an unprecedented scale. And in dying with their ancient knowledge, many of the children of the rising sun would not take part in the era known as Ugazi. Ugazi is known as the age of wickedness or the age of backwardsness. This is the time where human beings lost their connection with universal order and lost a great deal of their previous wisdom and ability, but used what was preserved to destroy Anna, the earth and Igwe the sky, as well as one another. Ogazi is the age we currently live in. In this age, individuals lost their ability to see more and now only see Madu, as the people of Azi are incapable of seeing the soul of an individual. In Igbo cosmology, all people exist as Madu and more person in essence or self and spirit. In Ugazi, the average person has lost connection with more and elements of self necessary to understand the whole of a person. And this began a fixation with the physical body and an inability to appreciate the abstract or the essence of an idea or thing. 
person. One example that was given to me by a Dibia who was explaining this era and how we're more focused on body than spirit in Ugazi was in masks. Most of our ancestral masks are what we would call abstract because the abstract allows you to see or give vision to the essence or spirit. According to our ancestors, many of the abstractions featured on African masks are also visible on everyday people if you're able to see their more. Art forms such as Uli, when done by a diviner, use a temporary tattooing ink called Uli to trace the abstract lines on a person's body that are no longer visible to the eyes of Umwazi. This also caused the loss of our ability to see the cosmic fields of the earth and the variances in energy held in certain places. This, as a result, led to the loss of much of the building knowledge of the past as sensing the energy of the land and using its fields to guide building allowed human beings to sustain peace with the land as they settled it. To date, many of the Arushi are built in set locations based on the energy of that particular place and follow a pattern that practices the principle of Ijiala, or holding the earth together. This is a set of human building activities and principles that enhance the harmony of a place through human activity, or as the name says, holds the land together. As Ugazi advances, the ability to do this recedes in the human mind. After losing sight of Mo, the mind of Umwazi became carnal, materialistic, and shallow. Umwazi in the age of Azi lost their connection with the universe and nature, and began to see human beings as something entirely independent of the universe itself, and often the only thing in the universe of any worth. Umwazi lost their ability and their interest in communicating with anything in the universe outside of themselves. And everywhere Umwazi appeared in nature, the natural balance of life reduced. From this, Umwazi unleashed a wave of destruction against nature that was previously unprecedented. Countless systems of ancient knowledge was destroyed, lost or abandoned, and those that were retained were used to destroy and maim both human and earth. The destructiveness and inclination to cause pain possessed by Umwazi is codified in names such as Azikiwe or Azi is worse than emotional pain, or even in the commonly heard phrase Azibakwa, a phrase literally wishing away Azi, which is similar to God forbid, said after something abominable is said or heard. But with all four ages, there are those within the age who meet the ills and concerns of their age head on, and reform the world around them by mastering its challenges. So, as we're in the middle of Ugaz, it's interesting to me to see who these people will be in our own era. The way that Ndiegede restored the spiritual balance of Ugachi and Umwangu, or the children of the rising sun, met the world's problems with uniquely human solutions in Ugamu. Most of all, it'd be interesting to see how things will look at the end of Ugazi when the cycle begins all over again. And that's it. In the beginning of the video, I said that there was another culture in another part of the world that had the exact same breakdown of four ages that humanity went through. Their breakdown matched the Igbo breakdown to an uncanny level, so I wanted to share it in this video and ask you guys what you think. Now, before I go into which culture this is and break down their four world ages, I'd like to give a shout out to the patrons that make this channel possible. Abigail Vasquez, Adako Utah, Akachi Lamb, Ako Mawokuri, Alejandro Diaz, Amaka Adogu, Amechi Ekugu, Ashani the Muse, Aya, Eneli, Carl Severin, C. Wano, Sessa Salam, Shante Thompson, Chino M, Chike, Chukumanze, Chris Abani, Celeste, Richmond, Crystal, Daria Mwokolo, Daryl King, Deja, Ekundayo, Ememe, Emeka Oha, Eze Chijoke Ujuku, I am Chizara, Isyama Orihu, Jess Akun, Courtney Rodney Brown, Christina Benjamin, Kwasi Densu, Lee, Linus Jade, Liz, Michael, N.C. Okeke, Nchedochuku, Ezokoli, Ngozi Onoha, Nia, Nick Crenshaw, Nina Wafia, Namdi, Uzuku, Nume Falak, Mwaka, The Ibo Cyber Shrine, Odenaka, Olise Mecca, Okapo, Okechuku Ebizie, Oshunfemi, Peach Cake, Rachel Mokoro, Raslin, Ehirim, Red Clay Roundup, Ross Jones, Sack Alexander, Sarah Mwafo, Sass, Shanae, Sharika Regina, Stan, Team Carib, Uche Agweze, Uren Nakara, 
Whitney Bryan Thompson, and Yaya West. Across the continent and an ocean, the concept of the four world ages reappears in the Hindu tradition on the Indian subcontinent. And according to the Hindu Vedas, the history of the world is broken into four distinct ages known as Yuga. I'm probably pronouncing that wrong. But the four Yuga in, uh, in the Hindu accounts are the Krit Yuga, the Treta Yuga, the Dwapra Yuga, and the Kali Yuga. Now, what really took me back is how well they correlated in the nature of each of the Yuga with the four Yuga in uh, Igbo cosmology. The first era is Krit Yuga where humanity was said to be governed by the gods and existed as pure and without evil. It said that in this time, people were filled with righteousness and the Dharma bull stood on four legs. Dharma itself is a very vast concept and would require a whole video or probably several videos to fully explain, uh, but it parallels the Igbo concept of uh, chi with elements of eke and ofo. But if you understand the concept of eke well, it's a closer parallel to eke than anything. In short, it's how something is manifest, which determines purpose and order. Uh, the legs of the Dharma bull communicate balance, order, and righteousness in the universe and individual. The more legs on the ground, the more balanced and whole the Dharma is in the universe. So in the Krit Yuga, the Dharma bull is standing on four legs, which represents totality, balance, and happiness. This age is said to last 4,000 celestial years, and morning and night, 400 years each. This age is similar to the first world age in Igbo cosmology, known as Ugaka, not only because it's proposed that human beings in Ugaka were one with the gods, like in the Hindu tradition, but they were also free from any form of corruption. It's also said that this era predates agriculture. And human beings acquired things by manifestation of will alone, without effort or work. The major difference between Ugaka and the Krit Yuga is that in Ugaka, there is no death. And according to my research, in the Krit Yuga, human beings died after roughly 100,000 years. But by the end of the Krit Yuga, this had shrunk, or this lifespan had shrunk, to 10,000 years. It's also important to note that in Ugaka, Human beings can go back and forth from life and death by their own volition, meaning that the human being in Ugaka can stay on earth and live for as long as they liked, and then choose to leave whenever they desired, as earth was seen as more of a vacation place from the real world, which was Akun, or the nest of Chuku. So one can interpret this going as death. The most striking comparison between Ugaka in Igbo cosmology and the Krit Yuga in the Hindu cosmology is that they're both the first age, and both traditions teach that human beings had no material bodies, but were instead light beings. The second age was the Treta Yuga, which correlates with Ugachi in Igbo cosmology. The Treta Yuga gets its name because it's said that the Dharma bull stands on three legs in this era. In the Treta Yuga, the powers of humankind have diminished, and the human connection to the universe and spirit has weakened from the first era, or, or the Krit Yuga. In the Treta Yuga, humans began to acquire material possessions, fight wars, and witness climate changes, which created the oceans and deserts. The Treta Yuga is when human beings developed an awareness of what my research called universal magnetism. Now, universal magnetism allows human beings to understand the forces of nature or what we would call the Abara in Igbo cosmology. The most interesting parallel between the Treta Yuga and the Ugachi in Igbo cosmology is that in this era, human beings began to understand or build their understanding of the forces of nature. In Igbo cosmology, this is when contact was reestablished with the Abara, or the spirit forces of the universe, and when the Arushi, or temples and shrines, were first built to channel the connection to the Abara. This is also the era in both the Igbo and Hindu traditions where human beings began to do sacrifices. I couldn't personally find much difference between the Treta Yuga and the idea of Ugachi, but again, I'm not an expert on the um, on Hindu cosmology, so if anybody knows more, comment below. The third age is the Dwapra Yuga, which parallels Ugaun and Igbo cosmology. In the Dwapra Yuga, human beings began to worship deities in temples and the human life expectancy had shrunk to 1,000 years. In the Hindu Third Age, human beings became more deceitful, and the reduction in their character introduced things such as disease and desire. But in this era, human beings also realized that their source of misfortunes was their straying from their dharma, and thus began to deliberately strive for righteous living and to align themselves with their dharma. 
in order to fix these problems. Now, it's important to note that in the Hindu accounts, these ages are strongly linked with the activities of the gods, which I won't go into in this video. But it's hard to speak of this particular era without mentioning the fact that this is the era by which Krishna returned to his celestial abode. But the Dwapra Yuga and Ugaun feature human beings applying human solutions to their problems. In my research on the Dwapra Yuga, I saw that the age was defined by a rise of what we would now define as mortal or modern problems. And Ugaun featured the same in Igbo cosmology. One major difference is that in the Hindu account, individuals began using temples and shrines in this particular era, whereas in the accounts of our ancestors, or the Igbo accounts, that was done in the era prior, though I would be interested in knowing if there was a difference between the temples and shrines of our ancestors in both of those eras. The final yuga in the Hindu accounts is the Kali Yuga, which aligns with Ugazi in Igbo cosmology. In this age, the Dharma bull stands on one leg and the spiritual capacity of human beings has reduced to one-fourth of its full potential, which was witnessed in the first age in the Hindu accounts, or the Krita Yuga. In the Kali Yuga, the human lifespan has shrunk to a hundred years, and the name Kali itself tells a lot about the era as it's defined as a time of strife and discord, which aligns with the meaning of the word. This age began when Krishna left the earth at the end of the Dwapra Yuga, and like Ugazi, this is an age of spiritual degeneration, chaos, and constant conflict, as well as a reduced ability by human beings to access the spiritual. And that is it. Let me know what you think below. I found it very interesting that the uh, Hindu account of the four world ages and the Igbo account of the four world ages lines up almost perfectly. You know, one thing that always gets brought up when discussing um, Igbo history is this possible connection with um, the uh, Hebrews of the Old Testament. And one of the things that gets said often is because there's so many uh, quote unquote parallels between the uh, Igbo culture and the Hebrew culture. It leaves me to wonder how well the people who say this know the other cultures of the world. Uh, because as I study Igbo cosmology and I apply what I already know or what I come to find out about cultures in different parts of the world, uh, the parallels are staggering and consistent. Um, and uh, you'd be very surprised as to where you would find these parallels. So anyways, this is Derek O'Fodermo with The Medicine Shell. Uh, let me know what you think below. And as always, thank you.